Today we're at Hendersonville, North Carolina at Olin's USA to bring you an inside look at their U.S. operations, what happens at this high-level R&D center. We're going to be talking to some of their market leaders, going through some of their training programs to really give you a solid understanding of just how much research and development goes into their products. We're all familiar with the motorsport success that Olin's has had throughout the years, but what some of you may not know is just how accessible their knowledge and experience is to the average enthusiast. So follow us as we take you around Olin's USA. So here we are at Olin's inside, and we're with Brian. He's the automotive product manager, and this is a really neat room, Brian. What goes on in here? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So this is our training room. Uh, this is where we train authorized service centers and race teams on how to service and rebuild dampers. Oh, okay, awesome. So the technicians kind of all go there. They all have a workstation. And uh, your instructor goes here? Exactly. So he provides them with the training there via a camera, and they can monitor it via the screens in front of each of the uh, service stations. So the screens aren't there right now, but they kind of go on those stands, right? Exactly. And so uh, every, everyone that takes the class gets their own hands-on experience get some classroom stuff. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they can learn all about the product inside and out. That's right. And I, I guess some of the advantage too is that uh, you can get your stuff serviced locally instead of sending them into like the factory every single time. Exactly, instead of going to Sweden for service, we do it right here at Olin's USA within a relatively quick time. And, uh, or you can have it done at any of the service centers across the country. That's totally cool. That's really good customer service. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're going to be bringing Brad in. He's our lead instructor. Okay. And he's going to show you how to, how to service a TTX 36 Motorsport damper and give you a little bit of training of your own. Oh, cool. So we get to look at all the guts and the insides. Exactly. So then we got over here. It looks like a, like a workstation for an instructor. Exactly. So an instructor, we may have six different race shops or, or teams here at a time where they can instruct on how to service the damper, how to rebuild the damper, or how to even revalve the damper for different race courses and so forth. So you have like a camera here and the workstation and uh, monitors over there exactly. so the, the guys could see it. They can replicate it there at, at each of their stations, what's being portrayed here on the screen. Oh. And it just makes it really easy to train six different teams at a time. So it's like hands-on and uh, uh, classroom learning too. Exactly. So I really like how uh, uh, you emphasize the uh, serviceability at a local level. Like I don't think any of the other manufacturers do that. Yeah, we want to give them the freedom to have a good relationship with their customers and develop a product that's exactly in tune for what that customer needs. Because as I know a lot of other companies, you got to send it back to their uh, company or main distributor and there's usually a wait and sometimes they can't get to your shocks for months. Right. Like, like uh, for my, my truck, actually, I have that problem right now. Like I, I broke one of the shocks and they said, uh, oh yeah, we can get to it in uh, maybe six weeks. Okay. And, and it's, you know, a truck we use every day and uh, yeah, that kind of sucks. And then if you're a race team, you might have a race coming up and... Uh, yeah, like it, it would take a month to ship it and get it serviced and sent back. Absolutely, and it, we, since we have dozens of, of automotive race shops around the country who can service dampers, uh, we have hundreds of motorcycle dealerships who can do the same thing, so lead times on service is greatly reduced. So let's say uh, some, some local racer was having some suspension problem. He went to his dealer to get revalved or have something done, and the dealer need some uh, higher end technical advice? Could he contact you and uh, get some ideas on how to, how to do the calibrations? Absolutely, uh, we, keep, we have two engineers on staff here that can be contact any day to talk about revalving, uh, different type of rebuild, and what's available. So, so, so a lot of it, you can get the, uh, the technology from the mothership at any of your dealers. Yeah, exactly, technology from the dealers and then additional levels of support available through Olin's USA. It's pretty awesome. So while we're in the training room, we've got some products on display and we can go through and describe some of the features and benefits of each product line. All right. Uh, so this table represents our road and track automotive product line. So uh, suspension kits engineered and designed specifically for popular sports cars that maybe go to the track uh, several times a year, but still daily driven. Okay. Uh, so these kits will use, typically it's a factory upper mount. Okay. Uh, have damping adjustability, so you can adjust rebound and compression with one clicker knob. Uh, have separate height adjustment from spring preload. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, they use a monotube damper. Oh, so this is a good feature. You can do corner weights without uh, changing your spring preload. Exactly. So once preload is, is preset based on that vehicle's weight, then we can do uh, corner weights with the height adjuster and you can dial the height exactly how you want it. So there's a, typically a, a range of at least an inch or so of height adjustability with each kit. And this is a single adjustable? This is one knob, okay. yeah, single one-way adjustment. It affects compression and rebound There's, about equally? or It's a 10% crosstalk, okay. so uh, mostly rebound. Okay. Uh, so it is a street-based damper, but uh, there is some crosstalk, about 10% with compression damper. Okay. And uh, are the struts all, in this, is this an inverted shaft strut? Yeah, this is. This is an inverted shaft, so it rides on two Teflon-coated bushings. It, so it's a monotube damper uh, with the bump stop internal at the base. Are, are your struts at this level typically inverted? Uh, they are, yeah. Okay. Uh, road track, uh, and any of our monotube struts are inverted. But, okay. Yeah. And that gives you a lot more rigidity and, uh, in the strut. In, indeed. Better rigidity, better longevity. Well, and here's a cutaway of the uh, uh, inverted. It is, yeah. So you get to see the bushings there where the, the uh, inverted damper rides on. You can see the uh, the, shift, the, uh, the piston shim stacks, our dual flow valve with, with its own uh, piston uh, shim stack there, uh, sill head. You can see the ore reservoirs, the, the high pressure gas chamber with the dividing piston. So it really gives you a, a, an idea of how everything functions internally. You can also see the, uh, the, the bleed there for the uh, low speed adjustment. It's adjusted via a knob at the base of the damper. Uh, so you can run this bleed in and out to allow uh, flu oil to bypass the main piston stack. So we talk about inverted, the body of the shock is actually the shaft. So you have this big fat guy that gives a lot of strength and the shaft is actually internal. That's right, it allows us to use a smaller shaft. Uh, it, it allows us to have a, a stronger design riding on these two large Teflon bushings. So there's more longevity, more strength. It's just a better overall design. That's really good to get the inverted shaft at this level of product. Exactly. Uh, so the, this, the next bench here represents our dedicated product line, which is new to Olin's. Uh, this product uses DFE-based dampers, but it's tuned more for track-focused cars. So if you've got race seats, uh, roll bar in the vehicle, you typically trail it to the track. This is the type of, of suspension kit that you would use. Uh, spring rates are tuned for uh, again, track focused cars with wide R compound tires mm -hmm. uh, typically include a helper spring, spherical upper mount with, with alignment adjustability. Uh, you can, if you're the type of, of owner who goes to the track uh, often but still drives a car on the street occasionally, uh, you can still run this pr product, but it is an off road use only uh, motorsport type product. Is this a, still a single adjustable? Still single adjustable, still, still mono tube. Um, but at a price point and, and features and benefits of a track-focused car. Now the DFE valve is the one that, uh, does that one give the feedback and it's uh, frequency sensitive? It is, it is frequency sensitive and it, kind of, it works more uh, almost like a blow off, like a motorsport blow off valve. Okay. Um, but at a price point that you typically aren't gonna see, you're not gonna see this type of technology typically at this price point. And uh, I guess the normal people's language, uh, when well, we we're talking about that, uh, you could actually have a lot of control force, but the shock is still responsive to little ripple bumps to reduce your tire shock, right? That's right. Yeah, and that's, that's a good thing. So you get the control of uh, stiff damping, but you have some of the uh, small bump, uh, high frequency response of having a softer shock, so you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's exactly right. We can get away with running a linear rate springs on the street, which is unique in some cases. And uh, yeah, it just creates a less harsh ride on the street and the ability to maintain control over curbing on the track. I, I see uh, like the Swift logo on your springs. Does Swift make your spring? That's right. For the dedicated line, uh, we have collaborated with Swift to manufacture the springs for these packages. So you, they are made to our specs and our colors, but they are manufactured by Swift. Swift is one of the highest quality uh, spring manufacturers, if you didn't know. Uh, so, so next up, we've, we've discussed road and track, we've discussed dedicated. Now we're working our way up to our TTX Pro line. So this is based on our TTX twin tube technology, but they are v complete vehicle packages. They're not custom one-off programs. They've been pre-tuned and uh, track tested and are ready to bolt onto the vehicle and head straight to the track. 
Okay, so they're and they're not custom. They're still application specific. That's correct. So anybody can buy it and stick it right on their car without fabrication and right. custom ordering and all that. That's exactly right. Hit ready to hit the racetrack. If it's an Audi R8, if it's a Nissan GTR, uh, Porsche GT3 models, uh, Lamborghini Huracan, any of those types of vehicles, we have an application. Now, Martin would probably want to know if you have one for the G20. <laughs> Not quite. That's where our custom program comes into play. Yeah, we can make an, a TTX application for almost any vehicle. So if, G, if it's a G20, we can make it happen. We may have a dealer that already has a package. So. Uh, a Not sure about the G20, but yeah. <laughs> so this is your TTX technology. It's ready to go, bolt on, no messing around, no fabrication. and uh... That's right. You get, you get to use what the racers are out winning championships with on your premium sports car. So uh, what are some of the cool things about the TTX? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest benefits of TTX technology is, is the ba internal balancing of the pressures inside the damper. Uh, we can get away with running a lot of compression damping if necessary without having to run a lot of gas pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, so we reduce that problem, we reduce friction internally, we have the ability to fine tune adjustment um, throughout the force range and uh, produce a damper that's very easy to, to use and, and win with. So a lot of that's because uh, are you using like a solid piston and uh, you're, you can get a lot higher fluid flow than you typically can? Exactly. We have a cutaway here of a TTX motorcycle shock, uh, but the technology that we use in motorcycle and automotive, mountain bike, uh, it's all the same TTX technology. So we can use this as an example of how it works. So uh, like Mike said, there is a solid piston on the, on the rod there. Uh, unlike a conventional shock absorber where the shims are, are all built onto the piston, uh, this solid piston is, is able to push a lot more fluid. So our shims and bleeds and everything are built into this head where you have separate adjustment of compression and rebound. So each of these has an internal check valve, so each side is truly independent. When you make an adjustment to compression, there is there's no effect on rebound and vice versa. So we have low speed bleeds in this unit, and if you, you can make it clicker set, setting changes to this rebound knob, and you can actually see the bleed open and close uh, inside that adjuster there. Um, so this is low speed. Now when you move up into a three or four way damper, you have the separate high and low speed adjustability. Uh, so you have a, a needle and seat that's adjusted via this Allen internally in this adjuster knob and then on the exterior of this hex adjusts the preload on the shim stack, so we have separate high-speed adjustability as well. So when you're talking about the twin tube, the, the twin tube is actually just a fluid transfer from one side of the piston to the other with the one-way check valves, right? Exactly, so uh, to reduce cavitation and to maintain a pressure balance inside the damper, as the fluid runs back through the cylinder head, it runs through the outside of the tube back behind the piston. So there's no pressure drop on the back side of the piston. So it's, it's not like a, uh, how we normally see a twin tube where it's kind of just where the fluid displacement for the foot valve goes. It, it's more like a, like a transfer port. Right, maybe on a conventional twin tube, the fluid, there's gas on the outside of this, of this second chamber and the fluid gets pressurized within that chamber. Um, this literally flows back through, back behind the piston to maintain that pressure balance. Yeah, so like, you know, a lot of people go, oh, monotube's better, and if you say twin tube, they'll think, oh, really? And, but it, yeah. it's, it's more just fluid transfer rather than uh, the, the normal, um, I guess, foot valve displacement zone or whatever you want to right. call it. Yeah, and, and that's true. TTX, when you hear twin tube, you might assume it's, it's a, an old school technology, but, but it's not. It's a very different technology that, that has that ability of, of full flow behind the piston. And that's pretty cool, because normally you're trying to uh, control your uh, compression forces uh, or with, well, actually all your forces with only the fluid that is from the shaft displacement, right? It's a really good point, yeah, that's right. So as on a typical shock absorber, shaft displacement is, is where you get displacement into that second base valve. 
we're not relying on that with this design. Yeah, so instead of like this much fluid, it's like that much fluid. It, right, which is a big difference. And it, it, even to your point, we have dampers like a TTX40 that is a through shaft damper, so we're not relying on the displacement of the shaft at all. It's a complete through shaft design. So you don't have to worry about uh, gas reaction force and all that. Exactly, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's actually really clever. This is a, uh, a Porsche, uh, the rear of a Porsche uh, GT3 Cup car. So this thing is hollow and the shaft actually pokes into, into that side, that's right? That's right, as the shaft goes through the body and the, and the cylinder head, it goes back through the top eye and uh, there, so there's no fluid displacement. So if our viewers didn't know, a lot of times when you have a remote reservoir and all that, that's to, uh, so when the shaft shoves into the shock, it displaces fluid and uh, that fluid is incompressible so it needs some place to go. So the remote reservoir has a floating piston that kind of compensates for the volume of the shaft. Uh, there's ga usually nitrogen gas behind there, and it kind of acts like a spring, and that's what we're talking about when we say gas reaction force. And what the through shaft does is since the shaft goes all the way through the shock, you don't need to worry about that uh, shaft displacement, and having all that extra pressure and all that is like, like a moot point nowadays. That's right. I, or at least with, with those shocks. Yeah, that's right. Now, there's a little bit of pressure in the uh, through shaft, though, to, uh, for cavitation there reasons, is. right? And, and just the expansion of the fluid. So there's about five bar of, of pressure just to keep, just to have a little bit of space as that fluid expands to, uh, to expand into in the top of the cylinder head. But yeah. very, very low pressure relative to some of the other competing shocks. That's about one third the pressure that's typical, I guess, right? Yeah. So it's just not necessary here, yeah? And, and the, the final thing is the uh, through shaft technology and... Yeah, so we have a good cutaway here that shows uh, the through shaft technology. It actually shows the fluids running uh, through this head and how, the, how it functions. We have this on display at PRI on, on a dyno to show that fluid running in and out of these heads and how it functions. Uh, you can see the check valves operating. You can see the fluid flow through that head. So yeah, really great tool to explain how this functions. And then I guess uh, if you're racing a class where they don't allow remote reservoirs, this is a yeah. This could be an good ideal way option. To get around it, yeah, right? it's yeah. very true. Yeah. And uh, are these your like custom uh, shocks that are built to to spec and to order? Uh, you see, yeah, you're right. So we have the ability to offer these as custom base dampers, where one of our race shops or a race team could build to order uh, based on their vehicle requirements or just like this damper here, which is a, a damper for a Porsche GT3 cup car rear, we have pre-assembled packages that are ready to bolt on and race. Oh, okay, so for like higher volume race cars, you have that technology. Right, exactly. All right, Mike, I wanted to show you one more thing before you left. Uh, we've got a custom road and track product line for customers who maybe don't have a common sports car, maybe something like an Infiniti G20 or, or maybe an old Toyota MR2. Or a Sentra SER. Even. Sentra SER. You, you can custom make a one-off package for that vehicle based on what spring rates you require, strut length, shock lengths. Uh, the kits come with all the hardware to, to fit, the, fit it to the vehicle. So what the customer would, would be responsible for is working with their maybe authorized service center uh, custom fitting the strut to their vehicle. We've got custom hardware, so you can buy an extrusion of aluminum that your authorized service center may stock. Which is like this, but not machine. Right, it comes in a bare blank extrusion, so you can cut it and machine it to fit your upright on your strut housing, mm -hmm. and it bolts right on. So uh, with a little custom work, you can fit it to almost any application. So you can get DFE technology for your old car. That's exactly right. And even, even as we move down here to the shock absorber line, uh, if you want DFE technology for a sports car, again, that's not in our catalog, mm -hmm. like this uh, Ford Mustang application, you can start with a, our base damper that's sold individually, mm -hmm. and we include different types of, of lower attachment points, whether it's a clevis or a, or a rubber end eye, and you can revalve it and respring it to that vehicle for a custom application. Or you can even have your local fabricator easily make something up for you. Exactly. Uh, it's a very popular kit for guys who maybe have less common sports cars. Man, uh, I mean, there's no reason not to have it anymore, right? That's right. And uh, easy local fabrication, nothing hard, and 
no long waits to get your stuff. That's right, you can work with your local authorized service center and they can fit it up to your vehicle and you'll be ready to go on the track or for your daily driver. Yeah, that's pretty good. And you know, like a lot of Moto IQ readers, they kind of have like different cars. Uh, you know, not a lot of them aren't mainstream. Yeah. So it's a perfect product. Thank you for showing us that. You got it, Mike. Well, I guess that's the uh, Olin's product line. A anything from stuff that's reasonably priced that anybody can buy all the way up to the trick of stuff and the best technology. Yeah, and that's the message we're trying to send is that we, we do have the high-end F1 technology and, and what you'd find on an LMP racing car, but we also have products for your Mazda Miata or your BMW M2. Uh, you name it, we have an offering for you. So, yeah, so, and, and speaking of LMP, let's go into our shake room and we'll show you a vehicle we have in there. This is Christo. He's the head of R&D at Owens North America. What do you do exactly here? So I, I run the engineering department here at Olin's USA. So it's uh, basically two roles. It's R&D for any US specific products. Could be race products, motorcycle products, all sort of thing. And the other thing is, is this machine here is the seven post shake rig. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use this as a tool for race teams, primarily using our stuff, uh, our shocks on there to help them improve the, the suspension. Mm -hmm. So they will rent this by the day and they would bring their race car in here and we would uh, use this machine to tune the suspension. And uh, what's great about this is you could simulate all kinds of uh, aerodynamic loads, cornering loads, and even uh, road surfaces, right? Yeah, correct. So this is what we call a seven post shake rig. And what that means is we have seven hydraulic actuators, mm -hmm. uh, one pan under each wheel that can move up and down and simulate a bump. Mm -hmm. And then we have three additional actuators that we attach straight to the body and they can push and pull with 3,000 pounds each mm -hmm. to do just that. So we, for example, in braking, they would pull down on the front and mm -hmm. push up on the rear. And for turns, you would put roll in the car. Mm -hmm. And then on a car like this that has a lot of downforce, we also apply the downforce to uh, simulate an exact lap. So the team might bring data from the track and we can replicate a lap like Sebring, for example. Mm -hmm. We can do an exact lap of Sebring, including curb strikes and everything. Oh, okay. And you could also do like frequency sweeps to kind of simulate uh, a wide variety of bumps, right? Yeah, so we do frequency sweeps to kind of isolate the uh, different uh, uh, things that are happening on the car, and it's easier to determine what's wrong or what needs to be fixed. It's more of a sterilized way of testing, if you will. And, and the big thing, too, is that this rig eliminates variables like uh, tire degradation, uh, difference in, in uh, temperature, track temperature, and driver fatigue and things like that. So it's, you eliminate all the uh, variables that are difficult to control, and you got repeatability. So if you wanted to try something, you could get exact repeatability from test to test, right? Exactly. So we can do maybe 50 plus changes in a day. Mm -hmm. That is exactly a back-to-back -back test, whereas on a track day, if you get three of those in a day, you've done a good job where everything stayed the same, the tires were exactly the same, the track conditions, um, yeah, every, everything stays the same. So you can also detect much smaller improvements here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then one small improvement might be hard to detect on a track, but you find three or four of those here, put them together, and now you have a good change for the track. And um, a lot of the things too is that this cuts down the expense for a team a lot because you're saving wear and tear on tires, uh, the car, the where, like, I guess a lot of things yeah, that the motor, it's a fuel, quite expensive to run. transportation costs. Yeah, and usually it can bring a smaller crew as well. Some of these teams, a big part of their operating expenses, you know, the big crew you need for run a, a test program on a track. So you don't need that, and you don't have to deal with rain delays and that sort of stuff. So you're the only suspension manufacturer in the U.S. that has one of these, right? Uh, yeah, we're the only in the U.S. That, that runs one of these on a commercial basis. The other ones are owned by the OEM manufacturers. Yeah, OE, and there are some commercial ones out there, and a lot of the race teams, some of the big uh, NASCAR teams, have their own rigs, actually. Oh, really? Okay. But this is one that we run all sorts of different cars on, and we're one of the few that offer track replay testing. I don't think anybody else does that, where we do the exact replication of a track so they can do that testing. It's very important for series where they have a limited number of test days too. Mm -hmm. and some series they allow only six days of testing for maybe a whole season. Oh, okay. So that, that adds to the value of coming here and tune. So when you go to an actual test day, 
you bring the data and you maybe get two days here out of the test day there on top of that um, test day on the track. Uh, so when you're developing street products, do you ever use the shaker rig on Yeah, it? yeah, absolutely. So we can bring a, a street product in here for the, for the same reason and we can work on two things. So on, on these cars, they don't care about comfort or, or how it feels at all. They just want it to be fast, right? Mm -hmm. The driver will just have to deal with whatever. But for a street product, you have to find a balance between comfort and, and performance. So we can use this tool even for that type of development. In fact, we have OE car manufacturers that bring cars in here mm -hmm. for ride analysis for this sort of reason. And they might bring a car they're developing, like a mule car or something that's not even out in the public. Mm -hmm. And they might bring four or five or six cars of other competitors to benchmark. Mm -hmm. So if they decide a BMW and a Mercedes and maybe some other car are the competitors in their market sphere, they bring those, we put them on here to benchmark, test how are they performing, make sure that their car is equal or better. Ah, okay, that's really interesting. So, so, so we can do everything from a pure street to that street performance, all the way to these uh, full-blown race cars on here. So um, some of this technology trickles down to products that uh, people like us can buy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we might be one of the few where I have everything from Formula One all the way uh, down to like street type products. So that's really good. And uh, thank you for taking your time and showing us your uh, killer tools and yeah. explaining everything. Yeah, no problems. So yeah, now that we checked out the LMP car on the shake rig, let's head on back into the training room and check out the uh, breakdown of the TTX shock. We've got Brad Stokes, one of our lead technicians. He's gonna break down a TTX 36 automotive shock and show you some of the technology and, and what's inside. So we shot a video of me and Brad taking apart this TTX 36 shock, going over to the internals, explaining how everything works. It's about an hour long. So we're gonna continue with our shop tour, but if you're really interested in seeing the guts of the TTX and how to take it apart and put it back together and what you would do to revalve it. Click the link in the description and you can see all this in great detail. Let's go continue the tour. A lot of you might not be familiar with the markets that Owen serves, so we're going to meet some of the business unit leaders and they're going to talk about the different markets. So we're here with Mike. That Mike runs the competition department and uh, for two-wheel products, right? Correct. Yeah, we do the... Uh racing department for superbike and flat track, which we consider ourselves a technology company. And we like to go to the racetrack and prove that that technology is better than the other brands out there. Um, basically what we have is we have a full support crew of about four to five guys that go to the road races with a trailer and service all of the bikes. We own about 75% of the paddock and have won the championship the last several years in superbike. And flat track, we dove into that about three years ago. We had one bike in the field, and now we have same thing, about 65, 70%, and we won the championship last year, and we're rolling along. That's a AMA? Correct, the AMA flat track, as well as the Moto America Superbike. And Superbikes, that's a lot of customer bikes, right? Um, there's several factory teams, and then there's a lot of customer teams. Uh, the grids this year are 19 riders. And then in the 600 class, which we support, there's usually about 50 to 60 riders. The 400 class is about 30. Um, all total, we could have 150 to 200 riders per weekend. Oh, okay. And uh, from the grassroots standpoint, I know like in our local area, the guys that do track days, that's getting to be a bigger and bigger thing with the bike guys. And uh, like, do you have a lot of customers that, that are just like street guys that do a lot of track days too, that send their stuff in? And Sure, we do that on a regular basis. We actually are partnered with N2 Track Days, um, as well as a couple others. So grassroots for us is probably the biggest market that we actually have even above the superbike market. Mm -hmm. And that does stem the entire country. We have several supporting dealers that are there um, that, there's probably about eight to 10 regions, and we have dealers in every one of those regions that go to the racetrack, whether it's for a track day or for a local grassroots race. And uh, a lot of your dealers can get trained right here to learn how to work on the shocks and do the service and revalving and things uh, for their customers locally, right? Correct. We just had a uh, training session about a month ago, and we'll do several of those a year, as well as we'll do some training at the racetrack as, you know, for some of those guys as well. So there we go. I mean. Olin's is a great product, uh, it's, it's uh, reachable, and you can get it serviced locally. What more could you ask for? Not much. 
<laughs> so we got Mike here. Mike is in charge of the uh, Harley Davidson market uh, for the motorcycle stuff, right? And you know, like I always thought of Harleys as guys that don't know anything about suspension and don't care about suspension. I mean, they have hardtails and what Wolens make some springs for the seat or something. <laughs> well, what's going we're, on? We're trying to market? change that message. Um, you know, we've been obviously. Um, We've been in the industry for 44 years, so we've been doing suspension components for a long time. But I would say the last 10 years, we've really been focused on uh, trying to uh, see if we could influence that market as well. We oh, know I that see. we have um, the ability to take the technology that we've learned and apply it to these motorcycles just so that they ride more comfortable. Right, and still give you, kind of do some education on what handling can be like, because a lot of these guys probably haven't even experienced it, right? Absolutely, and uh, you know it's also very challenging uh, because we sell something that you're going to feel. So uh, to try to influence them to test your product for the first time is always a challenge. But we know that uh, once we get them to actually ride on the product, that we could have a long-term customer probably for life. So, and and your primary market is like the bagger and the cruiser guys, or I know in the Harley market segment, at least in Southern California, the street tracker guys are kind of kind of growing. So it's Guys that get their Harleys to look like, uh, you know, the dirt trackers. And, sure. and those guys kind of run the canyons and things like that. Uh, and it is a different market demand of what's happening on the West Coast in comparison um, to out here on the East Coast. It seems like we have a lot of baggers, a lot of influence in that area out here. And then in, on the West Coast, uh, there's a lot of naked bike uh, that they're wanting to raise and raise the performance level. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, you know, California has always had kind of the influence of where the market could be going, so we pay attention to what's happening there. But um, it's not just the Harley market, it's, it's abroad, it's um, the whole street application. So Harley is just our fastest growing. It's rather mm -hmm. impressive how, um, how quickly this market is jumping and growing for us leaps and bounds. Now I know like the Harley guys are in the looks a lot. I bet you a lot of those guys get your product just because it looks cool. Well, you know, that's funny that when we first went after this market, we had to actually uh, consider a strong um, visual change to our product, which launched the Blackline products. Uh, I see. So we have Blackline shocks and uh, spring kits, and, and this was complementing what was desired in that market at the time. So it was very important. Uh, I, I guess, too, maybe your signature uh, kind of gold might be a status in that market at some point or another. It is, it's, it's almost like that, um, that the influencers in the market and your performance baggers and performance end of it, they want to see the gold. They want to show off that they've got premium suspension on, the pro on their bike, so um, it is. It's start we're starting to see that trend starting to happen and yeah, we absolutely are on board with that, so. So there we go, Hollins, Harley-Davidson, the street market, that's pretty awesome. Okay, so we're here with Jake. Jake's uh, the product manager for the bicycle department, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what you do for bikes? Yeah, so we've got a pretty wide product range. Um, initially started doing OEM business with Specialized. We developed a twin tube shock design for their downhill bike, the Demo. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of grew out of there. Uh, we grew into their more of their Enduro and kind of trail bike line mm -hmm. with the bike that's literally called the Enduro and then the Stump Jumper, more of their trail bike. Then we from there we developed uh, an air shock for the mm -hmm. rear and air shock for the fork. And then that moved into a coil for the fork and it just kept growing and growing until we uh, fully went into the aftermarket. So now we make a shock and fork for just about every bike out there from hardcore downhill bikes like the one behind us um, down to XC, you know, lightweight trail bikes and kind of everything in between. How, how sophisticated are the mountain bike shocks? Extraordinarily so. Um, the twin tube technology that we developed back in the early 90s um, has just been it's constantly being upgraded and all the things we've learned over the years has been put into this. And actually, a little interesting side note, um, the first company to introduce twin tube technology into mountain bikes was technically Cane Creek, but we okay. developed it, and they're just down the street, um, oh, okay. the Cane Creek double barrel. Um, and then they've since taken that design and moved on, um, and we adapted ours uh, for mountain biking. And, and to kind of clarify twin tube, you're talking twin tube, kind of like a solid piston, uh, to drive fluid through the uh, external valve cartridges, right? Yes, that was the initial design that came, we still use it for FSAE shocks for like the university students that do that, um, but the forces that mountain bikes see in off-road and generally speaking um, are a little too, a little too fast for, for that design. So our twin tube design has a hybrid system mm -hmm. where it's a shimmed piston in addition to having 
um, a separate compression valve head okay. um, in the in the head, actually up up here. So there's there's three kind of escape points for compression. It's you know through the main through the bleed port, um, through the shin piston, uh, main piston, and then through the compression valve up top. What adjustments do you typically have on the mountain bike shock? Well, I mean, you can have four-way independent adjustability, but you really don't need that many. And again, King Creek has like kind of a, a different philosophy where they have four different independent adjusters, but that's way more than most people need. And it's very easy to get confused. Mm -hmm. So all of our engineers have done the heavy lifting and narrowed the adjustment range to exactly what you need. Okay. So we have high-speed compression adjustment, mm -hmm. low-speed compression adjustment, and rebound adjustment, low-speed oh, okay. as well. Oh, mm -hmm. um, But you have, we have a vast aftermarket uh, tune bank available. So if you're a little heavy, a little faster, a little bit lighter, um, we have a valving package we've extensively tested to make sure the shock doesn't cavitate and okay. is perfectly balanced. And your aftermarket offerings, are they uh, kind of tuned per, per bike? Yes. So, so the rocker ratios and all that are pretty most, different in between. Most bike designs are kind of reaching a singularity where oh, like okay. in the earlier days, like from what you're saying, like there was, you know, leverage ratios from like 2.1 where to like 1.5 or some of the some of the earlier intenses you could never get full travel out of because they were so progressive. Right. Now most days you're seeing leverage ratios and like the average leverage ratio between like 3.2 to like 2.6. Oh, okay. um, so it's a lot easier to valve within there. I mean, there's still some outliers that are that are weird, um, but it's very easy to kind of to build within that range. Well, yeah, I think technology's kind of changed a lot, and in a way, it's stabilized some since since I was designing this stuff. It was the Wild West when you were designing. Yeah. I kind of have so many questions about uh, Ellsworth and Turner and how Specialized came in and just like that whole like historic yeah, period can, of design. I can rant for a long time, oh, but that, that wouldn't be right yeah, for this video yeah, exactly. Yeah, cut that. So um, I guess the e-bikes are a, a kind of a big thing too, right? And they're kind of like quasi uh, dirt bikes almost in the way. Yeah, right? I, a lot of people, they hear e-bike and they immediately think it has a throttle and it's just like people ripping through the trails and there's a lot of user conflict, at least in the US, or mm -hmm. in people's heads there are. They assume that people, like dudes that have no right to be on a bike are getting really deep into the backcountry and this bike is allowing them to do so. And that's partially true, but it, it's not really a throttle, it's just, it's a pedal assist. Oh, and I so didn't you can't, that. yeah, so you, instead of having a throttle, like you just twist it or use a thumb lever, um, the technology is actually pretty, uh, pretty well integrated where it measures the torque you're putting out and it matches it. Um, and you can, you can kind of change the amount of interference it has. You can turn it all the way off, so it's just a big, heavy 50 pound bike, or you can add a little bit more, like so you're feeling a little fitter, and it's a wind at your back, and then there's like a few turbo mode that's like, you don't break a sweat climbing up a brick wall. And, um, it, and suspension's really critical on those because they're pretty heavy. Absolutely, and like we have a huge advantage there because of our valving technology from years of in motorsports and like heavier, um, automobiles or chassis, like you know, with motorcycles being 250 to 500 pounds, um, it has a lot more in common with an e-bike than it does like a regular bike because the unsprung mass is so much less. And now that that's the sprung, unsprung mass on a bike is is coming up with the motor and the battery, mm -hmm. um, our valving technology, like because the wheels mostly stay on the ground, whereas like other bikes you're kind of popping off stuff. Right. It's hard to design a suspension system that's the best of both, where it's usually you're fighting back and forth, where like something that um, hugs the ground isn't really poppy and that's not as playful, not as playful. Mm -hmm. whereas e-bikes, they're pretty much sticking to the ground because of the weight and we know how to do that exceptionally well. And so actually some of our best-selling products are for uh, e-bikes. And that's the growing part of the market, I understand. It is the biggest growing one for sure. Um, that's why every single mountain bike manufacturer is producing them now, even some of the die-hard holdouts. You would, back in the day, that'd be like a dishonor. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, there are a lot of companies that are very much that way, you know, and they'll, they'll probably add a tagline, like, you know, pedal bike for death, and it's, it's fun until death, or they're adding a lot of jokes, but the bottom line is that, like, when you have $5,000 to spend on a high-end bike, are you gonna buy one with a motor, or are you gonna buy one with a pedal? Like, and most people, like, aside from the lead enthusiasts, like, I think they're gonna go with the e-bike. And the bottom line is, it's more fun. And that's, the, in the end, that's what's gonna sell it. You can get more laps in after work. You can go. You can reach further backcountry places than you can on your own. It's Specialized has a great tagline called "It's only it's you only faster," and I think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's just a great way to sell it. But there's always holdouts, you know, single speed zealots that'll or sing, you know, fixed gear guys that like absolutely have to have the hardest thing or some kind of work ethic tied to it. But 
It's the same thing with, to me, like snowboards and other, most other toys. Like, is it fun? Yes? Okay, cool. That's what's going to sell. Go with what's fun. And in Europe, it's already taken over. It's like, every single manufacturer has like a high selling e-bike. And this whole market segment that popped up while I haven't been paying attention, that's really interesting. I think it's going to start cannibalizing some of the moto sales um, because as some of the older generations age out or they're tired of getting their legs broken on a dirt bike, um, an e-bike is a great kind of middle ground. It allows you to get out, get some exercise, but still kind of taste that speed. Um, that, they, that they're missing on the motorbike. And again, they don't have to pay for gas, rebuilds, and like get sent in, sit in a car for 10 hours, they go to some track. Um, it's just, it's, there's a lot of benefits to it. So there we go. Um, Owens is big in bikes too. So uh, cars, motorcycles, bicycles, got it all. All right, so we got Jason here, and Jason is in charge of the uh, circle track market, right? Mostly late models? Yeah, typically uh, dirt light model racing, uh, asphalt light model racing, some sprint cars, uh, modifieds, you know, pretty much anything that goes left. And uh, you've kind of modernized the market because uh, when I was a kid, you'd go in the trailer and, you know, people would have 20 sets of shocks. And if you wanted to adjust them, you would just put some shocks with different valving. And uh, I guess you brought real race shocks to the market, right? Right. Um, when we initially set out in this endeavor for the dirt late model uh, section, uh, it was back in late 2000, I guess. Um, what you're referring to, the guys run AFCOs, Bill Steens, Pros, whatever. I mean, something that you could almost buy off the shelf at a parts store. You mm -hmm. know, uh, when we went in uh, with our LMJ, um, we pretty much took over because it was actual a double adjustable racing shock, you know, mm -hmm. versus, you know, like I said, something that you could put on your personal driver. So those things were like twin tubes with like foam in there. And absolutely, stuff too, right? absolutely. But believe it or not, they were really tough to beat on dirt um, because because they were not functioning properly. Um, it, it actually created better mechanical grip. So it was a, it was a big challenge to, to switch guys over from that to a gas pressurized shock. So like the fluid would foam and it would work good in the stuttery bump kind of things and yep. get you more. And mechanical. especially especially when it was real slick, when the track slicked off uh, super slow and you know uh, traction and grip was a, a big factor, that was the toughest place to, to beat them at. Um, when, the, when the tracks were rough and very aggressive bumps, fast, you know, things like that, uh, the gas pressure dominated. You know, it, it really, you know, you could really tell who had them versus who didn't at that section. What, what have you done to adapt the product to uh, those kind of conditions like the uh, slick, uh, stuttery bumps and things like that? <laughs> Man, hours upon hours upon hours of testing um, here in the in the labs on the dynos, the seven post rig. Um, but I can't tell you how many hours I've spent at the racetrack um, working on this because I've been doing it now. This is the twentieth year, so I know some of the uh, dirt track shocks have really big canisters. Is, is yeah. that part of the trick? Well, actually, that's that's funny that you say that. This year. Um, Back in December at the PRI show, we released our new LMJ Mark II. Mm -hmm. um, that that shock actually has a longer uh, canister to it, bigger in diameter than the original Mark I version does. Um, that, again, is to remove rod pressure from the shocks. Uh, rod pressure um, is basically pushing pushing the tire down, but therefore you, you don't really want it to when the racetrack is slick either. So that's what us road racers call gas reaction force. There you go, there you go. So I'm trying to remove as much of that as I possibly can, and by doing so, it increases everything in the slick tracks. So, and in dirt racing, the big money's won on the, on the slickest tracks can, you can find. So uh, the reasoning is the big canister, uh, the, gas, the gas pressure doesn't ramp up as quick, right? Correct. Correct. But, but you run basically the same, same pressure? Um, yeah, I mean, for example, if you had, I mean, this is very extreme, but if you had a two inch canister with 100 pounds of gas and a 10 inch canister with 100 pounds of gas, the rod pressure would be significantly different. You know, we're talking major pounds. As far as the ramp? As far as the ramp, yes. So as it's compressing, 
Um, but, but even still, it doesn't have to move very much on dirt to make a difference because mm -hmm. like, you know, say for example, our right rear and right front shocks, they're only t technically moving about a quarter to a half inch at a time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's like uh, the knee um, between low and high speed, super, super critical? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one, one way I describe it to, to folks is if you've ever looked at old England pitchers where they have cobblestone mm -hmm. roads or something, dirt tracks, when they get really hard and really slow, they look like that mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're looking down them. Um, and at that point, you have a lot of break and, break and grip. Mm -hmm. So the quicker you can get it to react, the better. So that's, again, that's, that's one of the features of the Mark II is we're trying to make it react faster. And yeah. so far, it's been pretty good. And I know a lot of, if you're watching this in California, you might not even understand this market, but if you've done some traveling around the country, um, you know, dirt ovals is, is huge, like bigger than road racing. And almost every decent town has like a track and everything. And they race once a week usually, right? Oh, more than once a week. There's currently there's active, there's over 5,000 active dirt late model teams in, in the U.S. Um, during the summer, we have a series that it's called the Summer Nationals. We actually run 30 races in 32 days. Wow. So we're racing every single night. And some nights you race till midnight and load up and drive eight hours to the next race. So it, it's, it's pretty intense. So, um, but just on a weekly, you know, the weekly deal, like for the Lucas Oil Series, for example, we run Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, every week. And uh, like there's a lot of grassroots, uh, like dirt track going on too, right? Yeah, yeah, there's some lower classes that are there. Um, street stocks, bombers, four cylinders, things like that. We're, we're not, our products are not really a, a part of that market per se. Um, typically, typically because of rule, you oh, know, okay. rule challenges. Um, and then, you know, they, a lot of them have a, a rule of a non take apart shock. Mm -hmm. You know, so once it's assembled, it can't be taken back. That's that's more of the Bilstein market, you know, things, people like that. So there we go. Owen's changing the uh, circle track market. Thank you for uh, coming to talk to us. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So we met Brian here when we first uh, arrived. So, uh, Brian, what do you do here? Yeah, so uh, I wear a, a few hats in the automotive department. So product management. Uh, business development, uh, work with uh, end users with uh, setting up their vehicles, we'll work with dealers, uh, taking care of them. So, yeah, a number of little hats. Uh, you're mostly in the automotive side, right? Me, all automotive. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, Jason, as as you said before, is our circle track guy. I focus more on sports cars. All right. And uh, I guess some of the things that we wanted to talk about is everyone thinks Olin is the baddest ass stuff and super high end, but. Uh, you know, I guess the thing is, is that they make stuff for everyday cars too, right? Right, yeah, so yeah, they would be right. We are super high end, but yeah, we also have street car, sports car products. So if you've got a Mazda Miata who, that you daily drive and go to the track a few times a year, we've got a great product for you. So or your you, STI. Or, or the STI or a Porsche 911 or a BMW M3. So it runs the gamut from Miata all the way up to winning Le Mans. We've got a product for you. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, uh, I mean, even me myself, I always wanted to get owns, but I go, hmm, I don't even think they make it for my car, probably. And then I found out that you make shocks for every single car I own. Yeah, you'd be surprised what we offer. And if we don't offer it in our catalog, we've got several dealers across the country that can custom make it for you. So, yeah, we, we will have an option for you. That's pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are, you, are you the uh, interface, too, like... Uh, for if somebody wants revalving and things like that in service? Absolutely, yeah, you can do that here at Olin's USA in Hendersonville, North Carolina, or we've got dozens of dealers across the country who can do it for you as well. So if someone maybe in your neighborhood that can take care of your car. That'd be really good, because that's a, that's a big problem with a lot of uh, grassroots guys. A lot of times it's their daily, and uh, they don't want their car down for a long time to get service. Yeah, exactly. Well, the good thing about our road and track product is the service interval is so long that it's not something you're going to have to worry about. You know, motorsport products naturally have so shorter service intervals to keep the performance at a top level. Road and track has an extended interval. So if you're daily driving the car, it's okay. 
So there we go. Yeah, you could you have everything from a pro team racing a prototype to a guy running a Miata in the local autocross, I guess, That's right? That's right. Runs the gamut. Yeah, it's very obtainable for everybody. Exactly. So we're with Bob. What do you do, Bob? Well, I'm the vice president of sales and marketing here at Olin's USA. So anything that has to do with sales, marketing, distribution kind of falls under my jurisdiction. So what's your philosophy on Olin's and how it relates to like everyday enthusiasts like us? You know, uh, Mike, Olin's is in a uh, unique position in the suspension world. Um, we have a, a different philosophy when it comes to what we offer the consumer. Um, we try to make it a full service. We're, we're really a technology company mm -hmm. that happens to make suspension. Oh, okay. We're also part of the Tenneco family, so we have a very big brother behind us mm -hmm. helping us along to achieve our goals. You know, but we do things like uh, we're in a room today that um, where we train our, our customers, our dealers, um, our WD partners, our race teams, they all come here to the, uh, the world capital of advanced suspension here in Henderson, North Carolina. And uh, we teach them the, the nuances of suspension. And I think that's a really cool thing that we do that not many other companies in the United States offer. So um, in addition to that, the products that we offer them are, are wide ranging. And it's just not automotive. As you talk to other guys today from our organization, we're into mountain bike, we're into motorcycle. And a lot of those technologies which are patented that we developed go from one market segment to another. So we're really a full-fledged suspension company. And, and a lot of, uh, I guess your advantage is some of those really high-end motorsports and high-end OEM development that you're involved in, it all trickles down and uh, you make it available directly to the grassroots Absolutely. consumer. And I think like a lot of other companies don't have that advantage, right? Like they're either mostly consumer-based or they're super high-end and don't, don't deal with uh, regular customers. Right. I mean, you have to look to our heritage. The company's been in business for 44 years. It was started by Kent Olins, um, and he was a racer. He was a motorcycle racer. So that is in our blood. And like you said, the technology and the lessons we learned on the track filter down to our consumer products, for example, on our road and track program for automotive, those same technologies started in the highest levels of racing, F1, all the way down. And, and I know, um, like I have an OEM engineering background myself, and some of the things that I have always seen is like a lot of the racing stuff and uh, even the performance aftermarket, like uh, th there wasn't like a knowledge of how to make things durable. And uh, from the OEM standpoint, maybe durability through the warranty period was like the focus more on performance. But w with your wide range of background uh, for your consumer products, you could have a lot of the performance stuff from your racing heritage, but a lot of the experience in how to make things durable from your OEM background, right? Absolutely, and, and if you look at the materials that we use in manufacturing our products, they're all high level, um, beautiful finishes, lightweight, all the things that are important to racers, we offer in a consumer version, which is really cool. So, you know, you could watch a race, maybe an oval race on TV and look at it, these names that you may recognize, and you could say, you know, I have similar technology in my car that's in the driveway. Mm -hmm. The other thing we do that's a little different is we believe an educated customer is our best customer. So if that's either a consumer, a specialized dealer, or a race team, we try to give them as much information as they could possibly have to help them make the best decision possible for their vehicle. There we have it. Like, uh you cover the market, everything from F1 to uh, some guy autocrossing. And even people like running canyons and doing performance, just driving for fun. Absolutely. And uh, it could be durable too. So what more could you ask for? Well, 
you know, we really enjoy what we're doing. We have a great bunch of enthusiasts here in the company, uh, and I think that portrays through what we sell. And I just want to thank you and your organization for coming down here and spending some time with us. Well, thank you for having us, right. and thank you for showing us all the goodies back there. So we could do Donut Media style. Hey, so here we are, Owen. Oh, it's cool, man, look at this. This is a shock. The shock goes up and down, and it's so awesome. It just blows my mind, blowing up graphics.